we've got this journey going on. This is a process, reintegration, death, rebirth, waking up, um, serving one's soul, uh, you process, which also happens in a team, um, connecting, becoming aware, and organization connecting. So something like Vivo Barefoot, not just learning from nature or not just making sustainable shoes, but actually realizing, hang on a minute, everything we do is is part of and serving life. So how about we start to engage with our customers and suppliers and partners and ambassadors and coaches in a different way that actually then starts to move into different value propositions, like actually helping people connect with nature um, or and then look at shoes that actually help us ground. And so, so it helps innovate, that helps the company think differently. Um, and they are now finding their own um, nature home, which is fascinating. You know, it's something me and myself and Galahad, the CEO there, have been sort of meditating on, you know, for them to find their own home because they've been coming here to Springwood for now a number of years. They've now found their own home. They're going to be developing their own home with all of the some of the learnings they've taken from here and, and their own work and weaving a, a home for themselves. And so there's there's the journey. But then there's what you're referring to here, which is a realization that we are always in if we wish through our intention and attention we're in we are the center point of the world i think it was black elk and i I refer to him and luther standing bear and others in the book um says and and was purported to say because often it's not clear who said what um but um was purported to say that actually the center of the world is where you are right now and what he meant by that is you know there's obviously an important journey around the medicine wheel and calling in the directions and and really finding and honoring the space the sacred space you are in and i do a lot of that work here at springwood and i have an area dedicated in in the woods very powerful um area that i work with where each of my coaching clients have a book for each of them there and i reflect on them and i tune into them and do my work there when i, I hold the organizations and people i coach there with intention and yet The center of that center point, that still point, we access in the moment, wherever we are, whether we're traveling, whether we're um, um, online with someone. And that comes through our ability to access and to go into the field, into inner nature and to work with consciousness because we are consciousness. We are that flowering rhizome um, that Carl Jung talked about. We live in a world of rising disconnect, distraction, and destruction, and it's increasingly apparent that the meta crisis now facing humanity cannot be solved with the same level of consciousness that created this crisis of crises. In the first place, nature work is an urgent response to this call for change, illuminating a pathway towards a new dawn where humanity finds harmony with all life on our planet. Jaws draws upon decades of research and experience in activating regenerative leadership consciousness to address the root problem of our interconnected crisis, blending pioneer, new, pioneering neuroscience and cutting-edge findings on consciousness with ancient wisdom. He has catalyzed a way of living and leading that, that's more resilient, agile, whole, and wise. In doing so, this book is a metaphysical foundation vital for for the revolution of regeneration. Giles Hutchins, Thought Leadership as the Cutting Edge of Synthesizing Nature, Leadership, Consciousness for Future Fit Business. His work has been called life-changing, and he is recognized world leader in the field of regenerative leadership. I've had him on many podcasts before, and I've been on his podcast. His latest book, Nature Works, is right here. We're so excited to have him because 
the Future Fit Leadership Academy and founder of Leadership Immersions, co-founder of Biomimicry for Creative Innovation and Regenerators. He runs a 60-acre leadership center at Springwood Farm, an area of outstanding natural beauty near London, the United Kingdom, previously held corporate roles. Giles Hutchins is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media, Innovators Magazine, and the Alohas Regenerative Foundation. Giles, it's so wonderful to have you here. Welcome back to the show. Uh, it's really nice. Thank you so much for inviting me back. It's such a pleasure to be here with you again, Mark. Uh, thank you so much. It feels like yesterday because it probably was. Uh, we did a, a Your Leading by Nature podcast not too long ago, and we've been in constant contact about uh, different events coming up at the uh, ancient woodlands of Springwood, your, your little neck of the woods that I'm so excited to uh, be coming and seeing you very soon. Um, so it's always a sheer pleasure. You are absolutely amazing my friend you come out with books at a pace that is unbelievable at least that's what it seems i read a lot of books and see a lot of different authors and speak to a lot of different authors and it seems to me like the books that you have they just have almost an evolution an awakening process that continually moves forward with more levels more degrees dimensions of enlightenment and consciousness and you have outdone yourself again. I've got your book here, Nature Works and Activating Conscious uh, Regenerative Leadership Consciousness. Right in front of me, I read the whole thing twice, actually, and went back and underlined and made notes. And it, it, I'm not going to complain too much. It wasn't the easiest book to get here in Germany. The, the, uh, the English publishing houses don't always make it the best, but you have a great publisher. And I've got it, and I, I cherish it, and it's so fitting. That's what we want to talk about today. But the first question is, how has that evolution occurred? Is it really true that they're building upon each other? Is there more... Uh, levels of enlightenment consciousness that you you've developed into that have led to this work yeah i mean i think it's quite an interesting question because it also talks about consciousness itself and ourselves in this sort of spiraling unfolding um sea of consciousness because of course sometimes we like to think we're the sort of producer of consciousness but actually consciousness is having its experience of life through us um and so yes they they are all of my books are a natural evolution and they're almost helping me um cultivating the ideas bringing them out into the book is, is part of the process and yet just like that spiraling vortex image there's also a core ground that they're coming from, which hasn't changed, actually, that's been there since I was younger, um, since my early out-of-body experiences, and is pervading all the books. I mean, I just had someone at a workshop here the other day who had also made their way through nature's work. Uh, and as you say, nature's works is, is, is quite a, you know, it's quite a big book. And there's a lot in it. And she'd worked her way through the entire book and then dipped into um, The Nature of Business, my first book. So this is over 10 years ago now. And she said she was still finding inspiration in that, just, just flicking through the pages and looking at it. So I'd like to think each of the book has their own, je ne sais quoi, its own little um, song line. But yet each book is bringing more. I mean, someone asked me um, uh, just the other day, what is my favorite book out of the ones I've written? And I have to say nature works because I probably think there's more of me in it than the other books, you know. Yeah, so it, it, for me, it goes back and forth. So I would say nature's work. I say nature works. I, I uh, tie it a lot to our Buck Minister Fuller. You know, what does a world that works for everyone look like? I've had a lot of people come back and say, oh, I don't like that. I don't like that word works, you know. Um, and I, 
over the time have been really speaking more and more about this work-life balance. And you you have as well uh, in, in businesses and organizations that you've touched over the the years, especially starting uh, uh, or having many experiences with KPMG and other consulting coaching for, for large organizations. Um, and, and I've really tried to pull back the the blinder, so so to say, is that work-life balance is bullshit. There is only life. We're not in the business of business. We're in the business of life, so to say. And it's really not even a business. It's just the universal ways that, that life works. And we're reconnecting to nature and leading by nature's example and that, that uh, wonderful beauty. Um, how, how have you run across that throughout the years and how... Uh, um, do you describe it in, in your terms and the way you, you bring it out? I think it's interesting words because on the one hand, they are so powerful. Um, yes, I think people can push against even leading. So leading by nature, leading leadership. Well, hang on a minute. I'm not a leader or I am a leader. And the same then with works. Well, what's working? What's, um, I think what you're speaking to is this sort of that we are allowing ourselves to allow more of life through us. And then the kind of work life balance, the the um, what's work, what's not work, what's leading, what's not leading kind of starts to wash away over time because we're opening. And perhaps that speaks also to your first question, which is the you know, how the books evolve. Maybe I'm just becoming more and more open to life flowing through me. Um, it's not my life. Um, yes, there's there's a soul, there's an aperture that is sort of um, pertinent to me. But actually, what's flowing through it is life, and I'm just learning to read that sacred text slightly better as I get older. Um, the process of of working with nature, let me use that word, working, is a sacred act. So it's, this isn't a rational analytic extraction, um, and I talk spend quite a lot of time in, in nature works hopefully conveying how we learn and, and work with nature in very different ways and essentially underneath it all is a working with nature that is in tune with in love with at, at one with nature and that's the ground that we then work with and that i feel is the ground for regenerative leadership for a truly regenerative way of living when we are we realize we are we are nature and nature is us We've we've come to this culmination of really how how the evolution has worked and how you you've you spoke about this work life balance and and how we look at it uh, because it is all life and and um, a big part of our lives our work and that reconnecting to nature that uh, realizing of consciousness is such an important part. In the beginning of your book, it's really unique um, because you you speak not only about Joseph Campbell, uh, you, you speak also, I believe, at one point in there about um, to a uh, quote to if you want to build a ship, give the men the yearning for the vastness of the sea instead of have it them go gather wood, and then you get into quantum physics a little bit. You talk about the holo movement and David Bohm, the physicist who was at the same time of Einstein. And funny enough, I just came from a pizza from the holo movement with Emmanuel Kunzelmann. And I said, hey, I'm reading this book, Nature Works. And the holo movement's in there, David Bohm, and he's talking about things that are in the book. And, and Giles, Giles is a good friend of mine. And we've had several podcasts and wow, you know, I was at the holo movement for a week and it's, it's about this raising of consciousness. It's about this wave of everybody jumping on this collective consciousness and, and leadership and how we can live in a new age and so i just was i was like because well, you and i have never spoken about that before although i know our circles uh, there's a lot of uh unique circles and so i i um saw as i finished the book and went throughout everything you know there's reference to daniel christian wall to to joseph campbell to david bohm and to to many many others and practices 
within the book that you've collected these wisdoms from, also where they've where they've written about them in the past. But a lot of the work is very unique to what you've done and developed over the years. Uh, one of your steps was originally six principles or six, uh, um, I think you either say principles or steps that you write about that actually there was a seventh missing in a previous article. And so there's been this evolution as well um, for you. Tell us, I want to go even deeper, uh, basically, is what I'm saying. How, tell us more about the evolution. Tell us more of how this, is it a time? Because coming this September, we're reaching a really solstice and unified movement in our, our time and period in our world where it's just naturally coming to the surface more. Go a little bit deeper for us. Yeah. Um there's a lot to be said about how the cosmos and outer changes in uh, the field are happening and the influence they have on how we are and our civilization. I think the underpinning aspect here is that in the regenerative business and leadership and sustainable business and um, culture and leadership transformation movements and conscious leadership and so forth, that a lot of the framing is still kind of around outer change. And what I'm conveying in, in Nature Works is the importance of not just nature out there, but nature in here, our inner nature. And that inner nature is here it's it's consciousness it's part of that that consciousness movement um and but through working with nature and through engaging in living systems we are essentially working and participating and co-creating with consciousness we are part opening ourselves up from a self as separate ego into a self as participatory uh, conduit and that's where we start to then work with nature's wisdom and what i've explored that's different from the previous books is I've dared to go into the what might be called the esoteric. Um, the esoteric, let's be clear here, I don't mean by that some form of sort of, you know, magical, mystical, um, elite school. Um, I actually mean um, the hidden, which is what esoteric truly means, which is um, what is slightly beyond the eye which is that we are participating in a reality and there's a lot to this reality. It's multidimensional in many ways. And when we're in this reality, when we're engaging with all of the changes that are going on in consciousness, in our daily lives, uh, then we can allow more to come in by opening our bandwidth, by becoming more sensitive to how nature works. And how nature really works isn't just on the outside, isn't just about biology, isn't just about biomimicry. Um, these are all useful insights, but it's actually about something much deeper, which is the, these, there are hidden patterns and processes and resonances that we can learn to work with. And when we invite those into our work, we allow a shift to happen that enables us to become regenerative and, and enables us to work with the way nature works. And if we just fix on outer nature and even ecosystem services and those pieces and ignore the inner, then we're actually still in the mechanistic mindset and we haven't truly crossed the threshold. And we find that our work becomes limited because we're not flowing really with life. So we need to step in to the river. We need to cross that threshold and truly work with inner and outer nature and so that's what nature works unveils is essentially there are um, patterns and principles and processes that help us work with inner nature and how do we as a leader then work with those inner nature principles and then apply them in practical ways to how we lead and operate in businesses so it's it is an it is inviting in the inverted commas esoteric the inner hidden aspects of life, which is about consciousness. But it's doing it in a way that is working with nature rather than making consciousness something separate from nature. 
That's so beautiful the way you put it. That it's really interesting that when we try to mechanize um, work in our organizations too much, there's this not only separateness, but what occurs is burnout, fatigue, job dissatisfaction. We see people yearning for that inner fulfillment. They feel like uh, they've turned into a robot. They're disconnected from their colleagues. They're just getting connected from their work, but they're also disconnected from the rest of the world. And that's very, very, very outer, but that unsatisfaction or that uh, conflict that they feel is really something internally. So um, I, I, having said that, I want to kind of even step back further. So there's a big, huge m movement now, and a, a lot um, who are come from the old, old world or the old ways of looking at things, they say, oh, that's woo-woo, that's esoteric and uh, uh, goblins and ghosts and, and, and whatever type of uh, uh, hocus pocus there is. But we're realizing that that consciousness, that uh, frequency, that resonance, this different way is actually not not woo woo or hocus pocus. Um, it's not esoteric. It's actually really the way the universe and the world has always worked. I mean, uh, you and I have probably in our age uh, have probably once uh, been to the hospital to uh, uh, have a scan or to to look at. I know that I have and been through a machine called the MRI machine, which stands for Magnetic Resonance Imager. It's a frequency of resonance into our atoms to look at our body, to see what's going on, to see those things. But there's a much a much deeper thing that, that not only is that a frequency, the way we see that, but there's a frequency that aligns and heals and connects us to that consciousness, allows us to see the way that the world works and, and, and nature works. And there's this even bigger thing, this microcosmos of the world around us. You're in Springwood, which is beautiful. The soils are healthy and the trees are wonderful and the air is uh, uh, beautiful as well. That That is a microcosmos of our human health. So if we're healthy and doing well, it's usually a, this microcosmos around us is a big contributor to that. And if our outer world is is sick or or not doing well, then it's usually our inner world has has some conflicts, and that's where that that business disconnect, that reductionism mechanism of jobs and organization we see come in a lot, and that's also where the rise of this work life balance type of t uh, talk comes comes into play. Um. Now that we know a side of this woo-woo and esoteric and all the other things that most business people might shut down or turn off or not be able to hear anymore, um, I, I want to go a little step further. In development process, is it possible to reach the inner consciousness to the inner development of us when we don't have a roof over our head, when we don't have infrastructure, when the world around us is not developed or giving us, putting us in a survival or f fight or flight mode. And I, I want to say, is this only for, for the developed countries, the developed man or those who have a job? Or is this also a process that works for, for everybody in, in developing countries or people suffering around the world? Yeah, there's a lot of um, different insights and research that explore this over the years. And I've run workshops now for hundreds and hundreds of leaders over, I mean, 15 years since I've been running workshops with leaders in nature and applying living systems uh, to organizations. And over that time, I've had all sorts. I've had leaders from African nations, from you know, Brazil, Argentina, um, Paraguay. Um, I have, I'm coaching at the moment online people from all parts of the world, including the Polynesian islands, all different cultures and different backgrounds. So I think I don't feel it is um, limited. I think it's about consciousness and that, that actually we all experience that. But we all have our own different stories and our own different acculturations and programming that we've been subjected to. And that might change depending on culture and background and so forth. But it's not that one necessarily benefits and the other excludes. 
So let me give you an example. Let's say someone has a lot of money. It may be that they've used that um, to advance their ability to be able to access activities that move them through the self-actualization phase. Yeah. And so they're out of that, to use Maslow's very simplistic pyramid, they're out of the kind of you know, the uh, the factors of having to survive and so forth. So they're able to move out. So they may have used that money wisely to help them create conditions that mean that they're more open and stimulated. Um, but it might also mean, um, um, and this happens because I coach different people from different walks of life that have inverted commas um, monetary wealth, that actually that wealth and their background and their story has meant that they're even more caught up in <laughs> the achiever mind and that they've built more protection rackets that make it even more difficult for them to actually get back to who they truly are, because that's what it is. It's an unveiling into um, the same as I've had with people. So I've been there's a workshop recently where there were some leaders from African nations um, and um, some of them after the workshop came to me and pulled me to one side and said, this is fascinating that the, the thing that you're conveying here is actually a relaying back to what I remember my grandfather used to teach us about how we were in nature and we've lost that. We're losing it and we're busy teaching ourselves out of it so that we can get with some future program that we're told is what we need to do to advance as humanity. And what you're telling us is that actually that program we're trying to get towards is now starting to change towards something that's more in line with what our grandfather was telling us. This is interesting. So would the African leader it, it, it depends if if they have an aptitude to go mm, there's something in this there's something that speaks to me and there's something that i know is true in this that's speaking to my heart that i want to take back and i want to really explore about how can we take some of these insights and to how we develop our organization differently and maybe that we should be activating some of this indigenous wisdom in a way that really comes in to how we work or they could be propelled, they could be resisting against it, going, no, this is the very thing that we've been told we need to move on from and we need to evolve and I need to get my MBA sorted and I need to get da 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 da, da. And, it, and it's actually you find even in people who have MBAs that even the MBAs are slowly changing and are, are starting to realise that there's more to this. I suppose what it comes to is us are we able to, whatever our life story, go through thresholds, crossings where we don't necessarily believe what's been served up to us, that we actually have the courage and the wherewithal to, to believe in our own true nature? And so that can happen to someone who is, inverted commas, poor, just as much as it can happen to someone who's rich. That said, I would say... Um, there is some truth in the Maslow hierarchy of needs that we go through sort of different stages of meaning making. And I use models and there are models in the book where I've drawn upon different adult developmental models that show that we almost go through stages of meaning making as adults. And some of those stages of meaning making are about us meeting our needs, sort of being an achiever, um, finding the ability to make one's mark on the world or at least be able to put a roof over our head and then from that place starting to go deeper. However, there are people who are in other walks of life who may not need to, if they feel a resonance, if they feel a truth, then it's not about having the roof over their head. It's not about the monetary. It's not about the material. Um, but if they feel scarce as a result of that, if they're looking at everyone else who has got a roof over their head and going, I just desperately need that, then they need to sort that out first before they're going to be interested in opening into <laughs> uh, a deeper connection with life. Does any of that make any sense? It's really about where, what is resonating with us in our individuals. I happen to have experiences when I was a child that showed me the interconnectedness of life, and that has informed me as I've gone through my journey. Um, but I could have easily get, got caught up in leader, leadership when I was offered um, more and more senior roles um, with the lure that comes with that, which is going into um, a social gathering or uh, a pub or whatever. And people asking, you, oh, what do you do? And, and you saying that, you know, you used to I was a director at KPMG and people immediately. Oh, yeah. And you get a certain ego established from that that you can hold on to and that then becomes your sense of self even though it's false 
underneath it all, I could tell it was false, even though I could see the lure of it. And so it's how much we get caught up in the lure. That said, there are people really struggling in all walks of life. I also find people struggling in all walks of life, regardless of how much they're actually earning. Now, I'm not saying it's it, it may be easier for them because they've got food on the table and they've got water and so forth. But I, I, I've i also noticed that it, just because someone's achieved X, Y, Z doesn't mean suddenly they've broken free. They've perhaps just created a load of protection rackets that they now need to try and unpick so they can get back to who they are. Yeah, I'm glad that you, you're seeing that as well. Do you see it more now? Is it more intense now than maybe back in in your childhood back when you were kpmg uh or is it or is it just that your your lens is more focused you can you can see it better now yeah it's very difficult to make that judgment because of my lens i am in it and i'm very much focusing all my life energy on the work i do um yet and i do notice through because I also help coach some um, people, practitioners or coaches coming into this space. And sometimes often I coach them or help them with coaching supervision. If they're working with clients, how can they bring in more regenerative practices into their work? Um, and I sometimes find some of those practitioners really struggling. Um, so I, I then work with them about how can they step into their power more and actually really find their soul gift rather than worrying about whether they are earning as much as they used to do when they were in corporate life or or whether they're making their way to, to try and believe in themselves because a lot of this is about truly working in a, a very intentional way um so it it might look to the outside for people that you know um i'm successful or whatever um but actually there's a lot of hard work that's gone in and it would have been far easier in some level for me to have stayed in corporate life 12 years ago um i was earning a very good salary back then and i would have been earning a, a far bigger salary now but as my wife reminds me that might have made it easier for the mortgage or the the, the debt or whatever and so forth but actually one soul would have dampened and if one one can work at that soul level with that energy and this is what i feel you do as well mark as one of our our resonances i think is that we just work at that soul level and therefore we allow some of the other things that might affect us just to go by and we don't get too caught up on them um whether it's people projecting things onto us or whatever and we keep with that soul knowing and i feel and this is back to our inner outer correspondence synchronistic way of living that then life comes with you and 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 you serve life and life serves you 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 it becomes a co-creative engagement doesn't mean to say it's easier but it does mean to say that little odd things synchronicities um occasions happen at almost sometimes just the right time and you go with that that doesn't mean to say it's not some kind of new age um manifestation um mantra where we just sort of sit back and hope that you know the stream will take us it's not it is a very intentional get up enjoy your work be with it but it's a form of craft and craftsmanship or artisanship where you are working the work itself is the service is the love and you flow with that love and then life shows up for you in a different way do you find that in your work Absolutely, I find it in my work uh, every day, and and just to to really because there's a couple of things. So you you've brought up Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You you brought up uh, evolution a few times. I want to maybe go back to the Maslow's hierarchy of needs and kind of uh, finish that, tie that up, that placement. So you and I have both been doing this work for a long time. I've been doing it very in a more of a social experiment with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I've asked um, 3,600 people on, on video, and you've been one of them, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Uh, and really, it goes back to this Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, this evolution. There's people in our age group, uh, Giles, and men, women um, that are, you know, 40s above 80s, uh, even 80 years of age, um, that I've asked that question. 
and they've broken down into tears. They didn't know. They've come back and said, can I answer it later? Or that's a weird question. I feel uncomfortable asking that question. Um, and there's also communication that they're still struggling with some of the bottom layers of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Breathing, food, water, sleeping, sex, homostasis, excretion. You know, they complain about going to the bathroom. They complain about no intimacy or, or just even the basics of sex or, or that they uh, can't eat certain things. They're, they're not doing very well. And then the next one, the, the um, uh, um, security of body, security of employment, security uh, of, of family, things like that, that just are kind of the basics. And it seems like at age 80, 50, 40, when I asked them this, that it was the first time they ever thought about it, that they came out and, and, and thought about it and it rattled them. They started to stutter, to sweat, to cry, uh, and had a real visceral emotional response from some of these people. And there's no finger pointing. It's, 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 it's okay if, you, if you've gotten the, f that far in life and you haven't asked because it's not too late. But uh, if you don't know the answer to that, the way our world and the systems in our world work around us is we're pulled into these other systems of, of how, how we're seen, how we need to work, and, and, and other systems that really can derail and diminish our light and also desensitize how we feel the world and, and how we interact on the world. Um, and create that evolutionary lifestyle that we want to live, that we that that somehow we we dream and think about anyway, even if you don't have the basics covered. You're somehow thinking, boy, it'd be better and you you see other examples in the world and then you try to strive for that. And um how how do you do you address those people? How how do you how do you speak to that? It, it's not too late. How how do you help them and say, you know, I, I don't have all the answers, but I'd love to, love to show you how. What is your process? How do you deal with that? Yeah, and in the book, I explore um, the, the you process essentially, which is a, a bit 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 deeper. It, it draws on Otto Sharma's work, but then you know builds it and, and goes in a slightly different direction which so it's just using the you maybe more as a symbol which is going down along the bottom and coming through um we are whether we like it or not we are caught up in quite a um exploitative uh energy that has been programming and has constrained us now one might argue that that journey of separation that we've been through has in in, in and of itself served a purpose in part of our evolution so i don't want to project onto it um because it may be you know drawing away from the sacredness of nature might be helping us become conscious as we draw ourselves back in to um to nature so that may well be part of uh, an overall spiraling process but the reality is right now um many parts of society civilization around the world are caught up in a uh, 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 an exploitative energy that takes us away from our center and so what we're exploring here is a bringing back into one's center bringing back into one's own sovereignty connecting to inner nature to outer nature to life and to allow one to connect into one's soul consciousness and that is both an individual and a collective experience and the both both happen together in a co-creative venture um, and yet what it is, it's not a fix uh, because the fix mentality comes from the achiever, cause effect, Newtonian mindset. It's more a, well, there's a quote that I sometimes use in my coaching sessions for people to reflect on, which is um, from a German philosopher, Johann Fitch, which is to be free is nothing. To become free is heavenly so to be free is nothing but to become free is heavenly it's the process of becoming which as you know is a strap line to leading by nature my previous book it's the process of becoming which is the very raison d'etre of life it's the, the the point of the journey is not to arrive the point of the journey is the journey 
not the destination. Now, that's quite a challenge because we are programmed in, we just get this thing done and then we'll be better if we can just put because we're we're essentially being exploited in very different forms. So we are working on the in the prison camp, and therefore, if we could just get this gut done, we'll get to the lunch break. Or if we just get this done, we'll get to the evening where we can go and have a, a switch off. Or if we just get this done, I'll, I'll work out my sentence and I can get my pension thing, and everything will be better. So it's all quite achiever because that energy works well for the system, and the Matrix is a very powerful film to convey that. Um, that the life force is being extracted through that process. If you allow yourself to realize that some of this prison, not all of this prison, but a lot of this prison is held together through our own psychic energy, and that if we, through our own intention, start to break out of the prison and realize, as Rumi said, um, realize that you are living in a prison with the doors wide open, and that you start to walk through these own prisons of your own mind, um, then you can start to liberate yourself. Now, that's not easy. And what we're saying is there's so many uh, structural existential reasons in society that are almost hampering you down. But I think it's worth conveying to whoever that is, the teenager, the 80 year old or whatever. And that takes time to build up the courage to convey and relate to their story. So I'd say that's the most important thing. First off is to get into their soul journey and understand where they're at, what's going on, resonate with them, empathize. It's got to be very empathic, tune in, work with them. A lot of the work I do is is energetic work with them at a soul level. And once you're there and you're with them, because you don't want to uh, de-emphasize certain aspects of their important story or their wounds that don't need to be just healed, that they actually need to be healed and learned from, back to our process of becoming. We're not trying to fix them. We're not trying to just get them to, oh, okay, now you're at this level. Um, you're at a teal level or you're at whatever level. And job done. No, the journey itself is going through the process of change. Um, yes, we need the achiever energy that helps get us to get up and go to want to engage in the journey in the first place um, of going down the U along the bottom and coming out the other side. But essentially, that whole process is to be engaged with. And so if the individual can see that this is about reconnecting into their own sovereignty, about really getting into their own power and then working with life, and the leader can see that this is going to help them become more future fit and going to help their organizations adapt to change in the future, then I find it very rare to come across people who don't want to engage in that. I think people do. You get some very hardened um, scientists, um, uh, uh, engineer types who are almost so much holding on but even them, when you resonate with their story, you find the reason why they initially went into a lot of this is because of their deep love and passion for life. <laughs> and they realize how that they've allowed themselves to get so caught up in a mechanistic version of science that it's actually starving their soul and that they just allow themselves to see beyond that limited version because it's actually an unfortunately a bastardization of science. It's not true science. It's a very limited quantized science that they themselves start liberating and start cracking. And, and unfortunately, usually with those cracks come tears, um, become releases. And then we begin on that downward part of the, the you, down towards connecting to who we truly are. Yeah, Otto Sharma is great in the theory you process as, as well as the Presencing Institute in that presencing into the future. You, you, you go on that downward and then the, the really the presencing into that future, that vision that we're, it's actually already in some respects from birth with us there um, of, of, of that evolution, uh, that journey that we can go, that wonderful process um, uh, that we're on. It's beautiful, and then as well, you you talked about uh, good to great, the teal or reinventing organizations. The kind of teal, it's not it's not about this this color, this this thing. It's much more this this process and this confinement that the that the that the prison is. Um, we're in a prison, but the doors are open. That we really need to understand that we are the ones who are creating a lot of uh, our suffering and our pain because we're not 
freeing ourselves to to walk through the door to to take those steps um, because of some programming as well. There might be some, even myself, who who would be jealous or um, envious that you at such a young age you had those experiences that have also ingrained you. I've had some of them myself. Um, it's not about it's not about that, but how do we all need to have uh, that experience, that moment in time where we go through this chrysalis moment? Do you think all of us have that opportunity where where we have these moments that kind of help us to, to see the world in a different way, to be able to go on that journey? And would you mind maybe sharing one or two of of, of what your experiences are? you had and if you didn't have them do you think that you would have still uh, been as quickly on that path or would have experienced that as well and do we need that as well yeah um so first i want to pick up on on the you a little bit because you mentioned birth which is quite interesting uh, i think it is that the whole arc of our life is a you and just as the arc of civilization is a you and we'll come on to that in a moment because i think there is an outer level of changes happening as well as our individual journeys. And they're all sort of starting to concatenate and, and build up together, which is quite powerful. But the, so you've got the you of your life, birthing, coming in, and it, but it's almost an opposite in a way. You, you start to forget <laughs> the source uh, and then you get to a point where you can start to remember and then bring in, if you so choose, a process of death rebirth where you go through a midlife crisis and you start to reorientate your life from um maybe the outer achiever into okay who am i why am i here what's my purpose and and and, and how can i flow with that um so that's a those have little use in them and many of the the use that we go through in our lives are the informing part of the journey um so some of those mini use can be um outer shocks like a car accident so one of my um, out of body experiences happened in the middle of a car accident. I don't think I've ever shared this publicly before. It was quite weird, um, very weird, in fact. Um, so it was one of it was quite a full on car accident. Um, we had in the end we had the um, the police, the ambulance, and the fire service on site, as well as um, a number uh, uh, over a hundred people around, and. Um, wasn't actually my fault, but there we go. That's neither here nor there. But um, uh, they each looked at me like, why aren't you, you know, do you not realize um, that y you should be dead? And then it was the case of we need to take you to the hospital. And I was like, I'm not going to the hospital. That's just, you know, it's just not useful right now. I need to carry on with what I'm doing. I'm, I'm not going. And they were like, I couldn't cut you. So they tested me for drugs, for alcohol, because they just thought there was something wrong with me, you know, because I was just. I was in a different space, you know, everything had happened. I was aware and conscious through the whole incident. Everything slowed down for me. And I remember quite calmly in my mind going, okay, Giles, we've got three options here. One, you're out of here. Um, two, you are going to be a drag on your family by getting caught up in hospital and being, you know, um, being on a drip for ages or whatever. Or three, you're going to, you know, move on from this. And if you do move on from this, then Let's learn from it. And something every time I've had an, an experience, and there's been a number of quite profound experiences, um, something I, I, I no doubt has gone into my psyche. I think something has been there, which has helped me be more courageous, perhaps in times of challenge. Um, but there's still an immense amount of fear. I'm still interested in how there's always fear here in my body, and maybe it's a good thing because it helps me keep keeps me in touch with you know this this reality um and also helps me empathize with all the people i coach and so forth so when springwood came along which again was quite a an, an epiphany experience completely synchronistic experience one minute i'm sitting in the woods making an intention about if there's any ancient woodland out here that wants to do the work i do taking leaders into nature let them be known to me and three hours later um, an email comes in about Springwood and then I follow down this path and it's very weird, very synchronistic path because literally a week before on one of the immersions I'd done, uh, a leader from Triodos Bank had been 
I'd come on one of my immersions. And that led to me then speaking to the CEO at Triodos and working out how I could potentially get a commercial mortgage to make this work and a number of sort of helpers pop up along the scene as you go. But yet the whole process was not a plain sale. It was full of pitfalls and snake traps and trip wires that if I had gone into my ego could have easily got ensnared on. But if one stayed in the true, I mean, there was nothing going to, I was not going to deviate from this. Um, it was the same when I left corporate life. The amount of friends and family who just thought me leaving corporate life when I was global head sustainability for an organization, everybody thought I was doing what was my dream and why would I leave? And uh, did they realize how crazy I was? You know, everybody was almost saying no. It was the same with Springwood Farm. Everybody I was speaking to was just like, no, this is just, you know, just don't, you know. And if it wasn't for that complete resolute knowing uh, that courage to overcome the fear, then I think things wouldn't have happened in my life the way they have done. But there is a level of fear. And that's, that's interesting for me. And I, I constantly work with it because I think that is what creates the prisons. And that's what helps me empathize with all the people I coach and the, the businesses I work with. Fear is really what we're up against here. Uh, I made a promise to myself, and I've, I'm good with my little promises because it was the promise I made to myself way back when I was 15 to go into business and then help transform business that made me get out of nearly getting sucked into the whole corporate machine. Um, but the later promise was when I came to Springwood, if I pulled this all off and if I made it happen, because I seemed to be every, everybody seemed to be against me at the time, even my own lawyer seemed to be creating problems why I couldn't buy Springwood. Um, if I was going to make it happen, I would truly trust in life. I would truly trust in life. And really that phrase to truly trust in life, I feel is what underpins a lot of this to actually trust and to connect with one's fellow human, with the, the earth, with the cosmos, and the, some of these energy shifts you talked about, that's how wide this is, but also with, with what's going on in the day-to-day -day and the experience of life. And I would love to say to you, Mark, that I have trusted in life since moving at Springwood. That hasn't happened. There, I generally, yes, I would say my level of trust in life has increased. Um, and writing even nature works and publishing nature works was an act of trust because my ego um, would say to me don't publish it you're going to talk about esoteric stuff you're going to switch off people who probably are your coaching clients it's not going to be good for your business all of these sorts of logical reasons for why not to publish it and so one I suppose in general yes my level of trust is there that I don't be holden by this fear but that fear is still there. And if that fear can be used in a way to project manage, to learn how to row the boat, to keep the wolf from the door, to pay the bank, all of those sorts of things, then it's fine. But if it creeps into, if it becomes a tool that serves, then fine. But if it creeps into, which it often does, because the ego has that capacity, and if it starts to get into the foundations of the very soil and the soul of what you're creating, then one needs to regularly purge and collect so i've learned over the time that actually each of the little equinoxes and so um solstices are very important times for me to do my own purging my own death rebirth my own little mini use um so i'm not sure if this is answered you had quite a few questions in your one question to me um but the only thing i i would also reflect on when talking about consciousness because this is a powerful uh dimension with we're, we're working with is many people first rate scientists and people like Carl Jung and people, you know, really well known, um, Albert Einstein have clearly said, you know, Albert Einstein, the only illusion in this life is the illusion of separation. Um, Carl Jung, the individual consciousness is only the flower and the fruit of a season. And we would do well to actually understand the rhizome. Um, the soil from which that consciousness flows, which is in our inner nature, is here in life. So, and yet we we overlook these people, even though they're first rate scientists in inverted commas, because we're still so caught up in this prison. And so that's the real challenge. And the revolution isn't out there. You know, yes, of course, we need to start changing. We need to have good solutions that are creating regenerative agriculture approaches and communities. We need all of that. But it's also a revolution in here. 
And sometimes we unwittingly get so carried away with doing the regenerative ag or regenerative culture initiative that we forget that unless we're bringing that consciousness in with us, we've slipped back into the prison. Um, so I think working with nature, regardless of where you're at in your life, um, is about overcoming what William James called the original sin, which is realizing that there is a depth, there is an inner capacity of life, and that when we have ep epiphanies or outer body experiences or moments, even when we're just on holiday and we have a little synchronicity or time stands still or a little deja vu, it doesn't matter what it is. We open a little tear in the fabric of the illusion of separation happens and we're in. And that is an important part of reality that is informing us. And I feel in these times with our mini U's that there's also a bigger U happening in civilization at the same time. And so that the veil between this world and the inner nature world is actually thinning. And we are starting to be able to upgrade, but it comes at a time of increasing fear. As Carl Jung, Joseph Campbell, and many, many have said, you know, it's the blackest moment in many ways where the insight comes. And so this rising fear we see in us is an opportunity for us to trust in life and actually go beyond the fear. And that's the process of becoming, not just fixing something, not just voting in better politicians, but actually realizing that we need to come to grips with our own fear and our own capacity to trust life. There's a lot there. There is absolutely a lot there. And I um, kind of say this yin, yin and yang, um, that at the moments where it's just as dark and as fearful and as I, I, I think it can't get any worse, is the times for me, at least, where it's been the most beautiful where it's been the most successes, where the most doors I, I realized, no matter how dark it was or how dark it is, that the doors open and I can actually walk through it and that it's opened the opportunity for me to see that the door is open and I can walk through it. And, you know, you, you talk about these mini U's on, on the U journey, on that downward journey. Um, I, I see it as this uh, inverted Gaussian curve, this inverted uh, bell curve, and that where it's this, this, this S is kind of a, in, it's a, a backwards S curve as we're going through that journey. And um, in life, you know, so in the working world, for most people, it's usually back in the, um, as far back as the 70s and, and even way back into the 30s, that curve lasted a lot longer. Those little transitions, people were able to say, yeah, I've been with this company for 15 years. And it kind of uh, did a fast forward around the 70s or maybe even the late 60s, mid 60s, where that started to become like every six months and, 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 and even sometimes shorter What's the next project? What's the next raise? What's the next position? What's the next, you know, the next thing? And it was always tied to this work instead of a life thing. It was always reduced and mechanized into work. So even if you worked in sustainability or environment back then, which was which was a pretty big thing, but there, there are a few hippies of us uh, uh, around um, that, even there, it was only something you did at work. It wasn't a full life principle and and sustainability, environment, nature. That isn't something that turns on when you get to work. It's not something that turns on uh, uh, when you're when you go to sleep or when you wake up. It's it's always there, and um, that reconnection is is so important. I want to go a little bit more into the evolution uh in, in some respects so you you've so eloquently uh said many of uh of the connections the, the wisdoms and the great people who said there is no separate separateness and um the, it, it's r really about that re realization in so uh, I maybe phrase it this way. You work with a lot of organizations, company, uh, Vivo 
Barefoot is also kind of a uh, wrote the foreword in your book along with another wonderful person, but also has a lot of examples of what you've you've done for them as an organization, or maybe even when they approached you, they were a startup. Um, they've gone through this evolutionary process to connect more with nature, to connect more with a place. And I see and the reason I kind of put it into this evolutionary thing is you've created a, a place, a power of place at Springwood and a coaching style and also a way of regenerative leadership in a certain way that brings all these things together, but it also brings it into a form of a, a power of place. Um, which is unique to to do a digital t detox to to have a place for people to actually make that connection again and come to some realizations and do that work uh, that inner work with you and kind of through guidance and, and to to see the world in a different way and there's there's uh, a, a lot of examples out there where where that's done before. The mix-up that I see in the world, or maybe the confusion, uh, is that we need to go to a place to find that. I think, and I want you to go in and talk about this more, I just want to throw out my thoughts uh, about this. I think you've created the conditions that are conducive to life, thrive, and flourish, but more so the, the conditions that are conducive for organizations and leaders to find a safe space to connect and, and realize a little bit more about life and make that connection in that journey. And I don't want to tell your processes or, or read the whole book for everybody because I think they need to read it themselves and, and, and discover that and also um, do that journey. But I want to say after they've done that in, in the spring woods and come there, I know that you also say, what you've just learned, what you've just seen, take that back to your place. Take that back to your company. Take that back to your home and give it that same feeling because it's not just in Springwood. It's every place on earth and you have that power. And so the, the, the last bit that I have to caveat on there, and hopefully you can remember that, is really isn't that place always being carried around within us? And as we can tap into that and we see that, that as I traveled the world, that place, my place, and that's the way I can function everywhere around the world is because I take it with me. It's with me and I know how to activate it wherever I go so that I can function, but I, I, I can also kind of show other people how it can be activated. And that's kind of what I want to, I'd like to go in a little bit more into depth in that process, but also how you then transition people a little bit without giving away too much of this wonderful wisdom. Yeah, well, I think there's, there's two ways to look at it. One is that we've got this journey going on. It's a process, reintegration, death, rebirth, waking up. Um, serving one's soul, uh, you process, which also happens in a team, um, connecting, becoming aware, an organization connecting. So something like Vivo Barefoot, not just learning from nature or not just making sustainable shoes, but actually realizing, hang on a minute, everything we do is is part of and serving life. So how about we start to engage with our customers and suppliers and partners and ambassadors and coaches in a different way that actually then starts to move into different value propositions like actually helping people connect with nature um or and then look at shoes that actually help us ground and so so it helps innovate that helps the company think differently um and they are now finding their own um nature home which is fascinating you know it's something me and myself and gala had the ceo there have been sort of meditating on you know for them to find their own home because they've been coming here to springwood for now a number of years they've now found their own home they're going to be developing their own home with all of the some of the learnings they've taken from here and and their own work and weaving a, a home for themselves and so there's there's the journey but then there's what you're referring to here, which is a realization that we are always in, if we wish. Through our intention and attention, we're in. We are the center point of the world. I think it was Black Elk, and I, I refer to him and Luther Standing Bear and others in the book, 
um, says and, and was purported to say, because um, often it's not clear who said what, um, but um, was purported to say that actually the center of the world is where you are right now. And what he meant by that is, you know, there's obviously an important journey around the medicine wheel and calling in the directions and and really finding and honoring the space, the sacred space you are in. And I do a lot of that work here at Springwood and I have an area dedicated in, in the woods, a very powerful um, area that I work with where each of my coaching clients I have a book for each of them there and I reflect on them and I tune into them and do my work there when I, I hold the organizations and people I coach there with intention. And yet, the center of that center point, that still point, we access in the moment, wherever we are, whether we're traveling, whether we're um, um, online with someone. And that comes through our ability to access and to go into the field, into inner nature and to work with consciousness because we are consciousness. We are that flowering rhizome um, that Carl Jung talked about. So I talk in the book. Um, and again, without giving away too much, you know, I go in, as you know, into quite a lot of um, detail around this whole process of working with stillness, um, the one. And out of the stillness comes that tension of the yin yang, the two, the duality. And rather than allowing that duality to get caught up in dualism, where we get caught on the tensions and we polarize and we separate. And before we know it, we're in our rational minds and we are no longer in life. We've pulled ourselves out as self as separate. Um, which unfortunately is what m most of our lives are, are believing is reality, which, which it isn't. Um, when we allow ourselves to get use the duality and use the sacred nature of the duality, which is the tensions in life, and this is what nature's wisdom is, is teaching us, to work with that energy that's innate within the duality to bring in the third, which is the energy that comes through the tension. Um, like I, the image um, I often use and I use in the book is the, 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 the bow, the archer and the bow. So you're holding the tension, you're pulling back the tension so you can fire that archer's arrow on target through the tension. That you're not collapsing the tension, um, but you're holding it. And that's a lot of what we're doing here is working with the duality of this life experience whilst remaining connected in the still point, connecting into our home, into our center point. When you're in that center place, you are flowing with soul, you are being regenerative, and then you can work with the tensions. The problem is, or the challenge, or the gift of life, is that when we get into the tensions, we quite easily get caught up in them. And the ego gets excited by them. So we then try and fix them. We need to collapse them. We feel uncomfortable by them. And oh gosh, if we could just sort it out. And so we, get, we then lose connection with the stillness and we pull ourselves out of the dance of life. And so if we can keep ourselves in, then we do what the Trinity is meant to represent, the three in one, um, which is con connecting to self, uh, connecting to source, whilst upgrading and working with the system that we're in. And that is to be truly regenerative. And now that act can happen when we're plowing and we're putting our hands in the ground and we're planting um, in a biodynamic farm, or it can happen when we're engaging with a group of people in a community. Um, it, or it can happen when we're engaging in an organization where we're trying to uh, develop products and services internationally. It doesn't matter what the field is we're working in. What matters is how we're working with that field and how we're coming through and allowing the stillness, the yin, to be the initial place that we're coming from. Stay in the yin. Work with the yang. I mean, it was Lao Tzu who said many thousand years ago, know the masculine, yet stay in the feminine. Know the yang, work with the yang energy, but stay in that yin energy. Stay in the stillness. Allow yourself to connect to source. And the vast majority of problems in the world today are a result of us up, uprooting ourselves from that source, um, from that field of inner nature, whatever you wish to call it, nature's wisdom. And our job as human beings is to dwell in both worlds, to walk between both worlds of earth and heaven, whatever your analogy is of, of the field of consciousness and also the realm of everyday manifestation, both, to work with both. And at the moment, we've got ourselves completely caught up in, in the concretized form of energy, which we think is you know, which we call matter and the world and how it operates. We're completely caught up in it. We have been allured, pulled into it to such an extent that now even talking about something spiritual is, oh, that's not scientific. 
well, actually, no, what we've done is we've completely drained science. Um, so science has now become a very narrow materialistic science, not true science at all. It's only interested in quantity um, and a linearity. And, and then we're trying to judge everything compared to that. Um, and you, you know, as well as I do, the, the challenges of the business case for sustainability, for instance, that you and I have both have to work with over the years. And then everything has to fit within that model. And what I'm saying is, no, let's connect, which is actually quite a simple, it's not necessarily easy, especially in our busyness and with all the stresses and strains going on. And if you're struggling with putting food on the table, whatever your challenges are, I'm not saying it's easy, but it is simple and it doesn't need a credit card or a debit card and it doesn't need to rely on other people. We can do that ourselves and it empowers us back into our own sovereignty. Um, do you, do you do a lot of, uh, so, I mean, let me ask you this way. When we talk regenerative, everybody automatically goes to regenerative agriculture. And, um, you, you've shown me over the years and, um, I tr try to bring this as well, which is hard for me because I'm actual a farmer and have been forever, um, to, to, to portray that because I automatically get it put in that category how, how do you open the eyes to so much more in regenerative uh along with consciousness how how do how does that how do you weave that web i am smiling because it was just the other day that my wife and i were having a conversation about this and we're almost saying, why not? Is it not conscious leadership, really? Is it regenerative leadership? Why the word regenerative? You know, is that confusing people? Does it get people ensnared on X, Y, Z? And isn't conscious leadership more open? And Well, the reasoning, I suppose, um, for me, this sense of connecting to nature with a capital N, so that's inner nature, outer nature, not some just outer objectified going for a walk, learning from a tree. I mean, much more than that. I mean, a connecting with consciousness, but making it of this world, the imminence as well as the transcendence, which again, I spend a lot of time talking about in the book, I feel is a very important part of my little soul journey, my little soul gift this time round. Yeah, it may change in future time rounds, who knows? But right now, with the way the world is, I feel a very important message or, or, and practice and way of working that I'm bringing for leaders because I used to be a business leader for many years and so business leaders trust me because I understand that I've been through the challenges of running complex P&Ls and delivering programs of change and working with different boards throughout the world so that's my it's my background um, that if unless we allow ourselves to connect in which is also an understanding that nature all around us, the air we breathe, the experience we have is alive, sentient and part of us, then anything that we then add on to our strategies, um, unless there is that understanding, it's more noise, quite frankly. It might be good for the brand. It might be good for X, Y, Z. But unless you are starting to really understand the way in which life really works, and you can feel it and sense it, um, then you have missed the point, really. I think it's um, a philosopher, Peter Kingsley, that I quote in the book, says something along the lines of, until you have understood reality in all its stillness, you are still lost. And so we can't understand the illusion of separation, really, I suppose is what I'm saying, until we've started to have those glimpses of reality. And this brings us back to that question you had earlier, which is, oh, well, gosh, it does that mean, have I only had those because of my out of body experiences? No, I think I have them every day when I wake up and see the sunlight. Now, would I have had those experiences without those out of body experiences? I have no idea, Mark, but I don't think it is those out of body experiences that are informing um, me being in love with the sunrise and the sunset and seeing the house martins and the swallows um, or whatever it is. And, and I, as I say, it's not just nature. Some of the one of the most profound out of body experiences I ever had was about humans and only about humans, because I was in the London underground when it happened. And it's quite sort of bizarre looking back on it. 
lasted only for about five minutes. These are usually quite short experiences. One one did last for a couple of days once. Um, and you've got to be careful because, you know, you run the risk of slightly going insane because your minds are open to so much <laughs> energy um, but in this particular experience it was only about five or five or so minutes and I was in the underground and I could I would I, I, I was obviously having a, an experience where I could sense the future before it was happening but I was also seeing as I was walking around everybody walking past me when I looked into anyone's eyes I just saw their souls I saw love and everyone and anyone, regardless of what frame of mind they were in, when they looked up and glanced at me, you could see them just this warmth, this glow, this happiness. And, and there was something in me then that made me realize that this is fundamentally all about love. Um, and that's where fear gets in the way, in a way. It sort of takes us out and me, oh, I can't fully love that person because of X, Y, Z. Or I can't fully love this life experience because actually I need to put food on the table. And I understand all those reasons. I have them myself. Um, and yet it is, I feel, about love when it comes down to it. That's what really makes us special as human beings. I mean, we call ourselves homo sapiens, which is actually about wisdom and wisdom beings. And I think we, you know, maybe we are the, we're the ones that work with wisdom and allow this working between worlds. Uh, but essentially, we are love. That's what's enabled us to form as tribes through ice ages and through um, ev evolving the way we have done is this capacity to truly love and connect with each other. Um, and I, I feel that enables us every time I've had these out-of-body experiences to truly connect um, and then these little stories that we've seen throughout our lives, like Sleeping Beauty or Cinderella or whatever the stories are that we heard when we were a child, make more sense to us when we realize that we are the Sleeping Beauty and that actually we're not kissing something out there, that actually we're just enlivening parts of ourselves and that falling in love with someone else is also an act of falling in love with part of ourselves. And as we deepen that falling in love process, we see more of life. We open up to consciousness. And then we might just be able to start working the way nature works. I'm glad that your wife uh, kind of sparked that process with you because um, <clears throat> we, we sometimes tend to get into these uh, word salads and word soups and, and alphabet soups, so to say, with uh, uh, terminologies. Uh, Regeneration is really 3.8 billion years old. It's as old as the beginnings of life on Earth, and it's closely tied to tied to this uh, symbiosis and symbiotic relationships in, in the natural world. And I see many of the things we do. We're 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 really pushing the this year's buzzwords or trends are. Uh, um, uh, biotech, AI, and quantum computing, quantum mechanics, a, a lot of things that mainly because of quantum computers. And you mentioned much earlier in our discussion, you know, bio, biomimicry. <clears throat> in our business models, in, in our life systems, we're like uh, adding value. We're uh, built in obsolescence. Well, how are we going to sell the next version of the iPhone? How are we going to sell the next version of the, even the, the barefoot, Vivo barefoot shoe? You know, what, it, what is the, the evolution, so to say, on the next product? And I think it's because w we know that regeneration, and, and I want you to correct me if I'm wrong, because this is, I'm really just, uh, it's also, boy, Mark's getting esoteric on us now, but I'm, but I'm not. We're, we're that, that regeneration is part of our life. It's ingrained in our DNA. It's a core. Uh, we, we have that knowledge uh, of, of the universe in us. It's, it's there. And so that, that regeneration uh, is also there. And so then when we get into whatever age or decade we were born and we start into the work life we're saying okay we, we've we've got to sell the next version and we've got to you know make it smaller and better and faster and how do we keep our cash flow going and how do we keep our our business surviving and it's it's almost a bastardization or a far distance from what that regeneration is with some 
kind of growth or new newness of that. Whereas regeneration is is not only a circular and seasonal system, and in your book you talk a lot about the seasons as well as as about how 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 that works, and that is part of that evolutionary process. Not not everybody's in uh, a season their entire life. It, it, hopefully the seasons change. Otherwise, maybe you you don't want to be be there. But um, that applies to every different aspect of life and um if we can get those principles if we can get that universal way of regeneration into our organizations into our lives into the way we we produce and and do things i think and follow those seasons more so that we come to rest so that we come to awareness so that we feed our souls and have that uh that that inner inner place with us wherever we're at um i think it really helps and and uh, you know i don't know how much you would have to say for that but that's when i hear about that that's really what what um resonates with me and i believe that's where we've distanced ourselves but it's not too far of a stretch once the veil's been removed or once people start to see that connection again to really pick right up on that and, and create a beautiful life and a beautiful way of, if we have to work, work. I, I, I hate to separate work and life. Uh, I think it's just life. Yeah. Well, I, 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 there's, there's a couple of things. One, I, I, I've, you've, you've helped re enliven the importance of regeneration um, um, and why I, I like it because it, yes, you're right. It is it's just, it's, it's even beyond 3.8 billion years. It's the universe. And there is something uh, that I love the circle, but if you slightly twist that circle and give it a bit of 3d, it, you get a figure of eight, um, which is three dimensional. And you've got that back loop and you've got that front loop and the egos prefer just the front loop piece, the spring summer piece, the doing the outer, the let's make it happen. That's what's happened today. We're caught up in that mechanistic just looking at the outer that's why when we say learn from nature it's just about an outer or nature connection let's go out into nature and connect and, and that's great um but actually we're talking about the whole back loop we're talking about the whole figure of eight the death rebirth process and what we generate speaks to me is the rebirth it's not just a birthing it's a rebirthing so back to your uh, point earlier about the, the process of birth itself was a regenerative act we have the opportunity this lifetime to have another death rebirth we have the opportunity to have a psychological death rebirth. And that's what all of the ancient wisdom traditions are speaking to. That's what the symbol of Christ on the cross and whatever the symbology um, that you wish to use is speaking to is that in this lifetime, as well as the thresholds of birth and death physically, we have the opportunity psychologically to go through a threshold crossing to regenerate our own psyches, to upstretch or re-enliven how we perceive life and that is a regenerative act and i believe that that regenerative act I, I don't even believe i know that that regenerative act is a part and parcel of waking up to the fact that we are nature and nature is us and that we as conscious beings with this ego of ours this self-reflective ego actually have a responsibility a responsiveness a a receptivity to be able to um, serve life as co-creators and to really work with that rhizome, that soil. Um, and at the moment, we're not. We are, in the large part, there are, of course, many communities and people that, that are, but in the large part, we are at odds with life. And back to your quote that you mentioned right earlier in our conversation, if you want to build a ship, don't assign people tasks and chop up wood and um, instead, teach them to long for the immensity of the sea. Now, so often we are doing in the sustainability and the environmental movements and all of these movements that I've known for a large part of my life, um, we are getting too caught up in assigning tasks and chopping wood. And we've forgotten to teach ourselves and others to long for the immensity of the sea. The immensity of the sea is here. This experience of life is awesome. We are sometimes trampling over in our desire to try and fix the world. And therefore, we actually drain the lifeblood out of our own selves in so doing. And the invitation of nature works is just to bring back in the sacred, to invite into the party, not just the 
gathering at the party because we know we need to gather at the party because something's got to change because the world's going to hell in a handcart otherwise. Yes, gather people at the party with that message. But now we're at the party. Let's really dance. And to really dance, we need to fall back in love with life and we need to truly understand the magnificence of this existence. And that's to teach people to long for the immensity of this sea. And I hope this little book, Nature Works, is a contributor to that. Absolutely, it is. And it's also um, split up into a, a, a few sections. And the last section is more the different tools and, and practical ways you can go in to to reconnect with that inner to also put it into practice to discover more and to delve out which is uh i, I believe you called it the appendix but it's really it's I, I hate to say it's separate from the book but it's really that which which tool which application which method fits best to you or resonates most with you and then really goes into detail of how to apply it, where to apply it, how, how, how to use it. So I really thank you for that. And just to let everybody know, uh, um, please go read it and, and go in and, and, and look at that deeply because there, it, it's not just thoughts and philosophies. It's really uh, your life's work, journey, and uh, practical application. You're giving not only Vivo Barefoot to other uh, clients you've worked with, your own experiences, but telling and making sense of this journey, this theory, you journey, and this deepening to presence us into the future to really connect with that consciousness beyond what anybody would would want to say you know that's woo woo esoteric there's nothing about that and it doesn't come across that way i could sense that there was that little bit of fear and you like uh people are going to think i'm crazy this is a little woo woo and it's not at all giles it's really spot on you you uh not only do you do you uh mention all the people that resonate with me joseph campbell uh, um David Bohm, the Holo Movement, and thousands, many others that we've mentioned throughout the podcast so far, that none of were woo woo, and uh, there there was one that I could maybe think in, uh, of, and that is um, uh, uh, Reinhold uh, uh, Rudolf Steiner, and uh, the um, basically he a lot of people thought he was pretty woo woo. But he also created the Baldor schools and biodynamic agriculture and many, many beautiful things and probably was at the time. But as the, the standard for a lot of movements and practices we have today that have guided us in, in a lot of directions and can even catapult us much further. So I appreciate that sharing. I am going to ask you again, you're not going to, to get away from, from this. Um, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you, Giles? I feel it has to involve um, us respecting each other's journey and, and story. Um, but it's a world that understands a human uh, world, um, and then we'll come to the wider world, uh, a human world that truly understands the importance of education in its truest sense, educia, to bring forth to allow us back to our concept of um, to be free is nothing, to become free is, is everything or heavenly. The process of becoming, that we have an educatory process of life. It's not, I don't mean going to school and wearing a uniform. I, I think that's, that's not, not helpful. But the, a whole process that brings us out, that allows people to sing their tune so that, that that human system can serve life, all of life. So it's not a world that works for every one, inverted commas, but everyone and everything and ev ev the whole of life on Earth, the whole of um, uh, of all of it, really, um, to feel that the the river tumbling down into the ocean is in and of itself sacred and an important part of the source consciousness of this planet. Um, and so educeo, I would say, education to truly bring forth is an important part of what would enable a world that works for everyone so that we fall back in love with life. Um, did you come up with this saying? I'm, I'm just going to read. Uh, I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to say it. I, I want to know if you created this, if this comes from someone else, if this was you and Laura Storm together. 
Regeneration is creating the conditions that are conducive to life, to thrive and flourish amid ever-changing life conditions. Is that something that you guys came up with? Did you come up I with think, that? I think Where did um, you find it? those words are coming from regenerative leadership, which is what Law and I wrote. However, the phrase creating conditions conducive to life is Janine Benyus's, who wrote the book Biomimicry. So that's the framing. The phrasing of that, I think, was something that was formed part of regenerative leadership. This is the fas fascinating thing of writing these books, is you can pretty much, well, I can anyway, pretty much remember everything. <laughs> and and yeah. so the act of, back to our Edusia, the act of even writing and, and taking them out and bringing them and birthing them into the world is part of that education process for me. But that phrase that you just referred to, I think, comes from regenerative leadership. But the core essence yes. of it is Janine Benyus's. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 that's what I thought too. But it's it's actually all all of ours. It's like like you said, well, exactly. more than three point eight. Yeah, it's just how do we get that consciousness to connect the under a little bit more of that understanding, and um, that that is a great thing about writing the books because you've embodied it, you live it, you know it, you wrote the words. Um, I didn't write the words, but I wasn't reading that quote anywhere. I've got it so ingrained in my life and, and, and my mind and in my practices that it is just a part of me. And it's a strong belief and knowing of that. And I'm far from the tree hugger, hippie, esoteric that you would ever find. But yet I love to hang out with you. I love to do these things and have these discussions with you. And Giles, I unless there's something major that we left out or that you want to make sure that we've touched upon in the book, uh, Nature Works, uh, that you that you would like to leave as a departing words for, for the listeners that we should have talked about, this is your chance. Otherwise, I'm going to say goodbye. I'm happy to say goodbye, my friend. Thank you so much for the work that you do and the Aloha's Foundation. I'm very much looking forward to you coming and having a walk in the woods with me very soon. And thank you for hosting this podcast and sharing um, the word about nature works. Thank you. Thank you so much, Giles. Thanks for letting us all inside of your ideas. And we'll put all the links and uh, promote it as much as we can. Thank you so much.